So now Keynes comes on the scene. Others have criticized this, but Keynes is obviously the, the one that becomes um, crucial in economic theory. In the 1920s, after World War I, Europe was mired in poverty, uh, intractable unemployment, and Keynes was already clear at a practical level that you had to have state intervention. Even though, in the theoretical level, there's no need for state intervention. Keynes is already proposing 20 years, um, 15 years before he wrote the general theory in the 1920s, he was proposing large-scale public expenditures to lift Europe out of the morass of widespread unemployment. By the time the Great Depression arrived in 1929, 1930s, he strongly advocated that the expenditures for government intervention should be financed by large-scale government deficits. In fact, he even explicitly proposed at one point that the world's finance minister should print money in concert altogether, I'm quoting, as a means of restoring confidence to a world market that had been frozen in the face of economic failure. The key point was that they should pump up additional purchasing power in the economy. And it wouldn't do to just reduce taxes because this represents, if, if it, that the same money was just spent by the government, because it represents uh, um, uh, reduction in government expenditures. If you reduce taxes and government expenditures fall, you reduce aggregate demand. And if people spend the money they get, you increase aggregate demand. In fact, not quite as much because they save a little bit. So just reducing taxes wouldn't work. It's very familiar, right? All the debates in the last 20 years in US politics have been about this issue. Reduction of taxes will make us as Donald Trump would say, rich again. It makes him rich again, that's for sure. But the, the macroeconomic question is it will make so-called us rich again. And there's also a practical issue, which is that Hitler had already shown in practice that it's possible to increase aggregate demand in a very short time and go from substantial unemployment to full employment by military what used to be called military Keynesianism, military expenditures, which pumped up aggregate demand. So it wasn't just a theoretical question. Keynes already knew the practical answer. The question is, how do you find a theoretical ground for the practical answer? Now, this is something I mentioned before. So all the great economists are taking their understanding from the real. He's not saying, let me go back to the ideal world of perfect competition. And he's saying, look, this is an argument that's fundamentally unsound in the face of reality. So where is the deficiency? Where is the deficiency? And he himself says, this is a great struggle on his part to figure out how to break free. And he chooses, in the end, to formulate the aggregate demand supply relationship differently. Now notice, in the uh, neoclassical argument, the aggregate supply demand relationship is formulated in the demand and supply for loanable funds. So if he's going to say that aggregate demand and aggregate supply are not equal automatically, that's or it's a mechanism there, he has to abandon the loanable funds argument, which is what he does. He replaces it with what he calls liquidity preference theory of the interest rate. But that's not because he picks it out of the air, because to be consistent with his other argument about where employment comes from, which is not automatic full employment, he will have to come up with another mechanism for the interest rate also. Okay? So let's see what he ends up saying. He chooses to attack the two key assumptions in the neoclassical theory, uh, in the pre-Keynesian theory, really. One is that the real wage clears demand and supply for labor, which is key because that determines full employment and that gives you the full amount of output. And the other is, as I just pointed out, um, the idea that the adjustment of loanable funds will give you demand equal to supply. So he has to attack both of those because those are the key components. And of course, we, are, we know um, that. Um, what the basic structure of his argument is. He starts off by saying that firms produce in advance of demand. Because when they start production, they have to base themselves on expected demand. He says production takes time. So he brings time into the story. If production takes time, you must be producing for the basis of expected demand. And so expected demand comes into the story right away. And he says, well, expected demand, in effect, will be roughly equal to actual demand. So it's not true that the, uh, there's anything fundamentally wrong with, damn, hang on. 
Expected demand is a driver, uh, but it's going to be roughly equal to aggregate actual demand because expectations will adjust. They won't be persistently wrong, though they can be wrong at any moment of time. They go up and down. So you can think this is a fluctuating process around the actual demand. Actual demand is determined by consumption and investment, actual consumption and investment expenditures. Consumption is now, this is one of the key breaks in Keynes's argument, is a function of income with some autonomous component. So it's uh, uh, autonomous consumption plus a propensity to consume times income. This is the simplest formulation, but brings out all the essential argument. And output is produced for expected demand, because production takes time. Everybody with me here? Should be pretty straightforward here. I'm bringing the expectation part because it's crucial to much of the debates that go on afterwards, including the classical argument. OK. Well, if you do that, then you know if you solve for the equilibrium output, which is the output that satisfies all of these relations, then you'll have autonomous consumption plus investment, which is a function of, and this is Keynes' key point, of the net rate of return, expected net rate of return. Fun he calls this expected rate of return the marginal efficiency of investment. And he makes a point this is expected, of course. Because if you built a plant now, and you're planning to use it for 30 years, you're basing yourself on the profit that you expect to make from the plant. Net of the interest rate. And strictly speaking, this should also be the expected rate of interest. But to simplify the argument, I'm skipping over that part. But also, interest rates are adjustable and locally, and you can lock in an interest rate. You cannot, unfortunately, lock in a rate of return. It would be lovely if every firm would say, I'll oh, build this plant if you just guarantee me 18%. But except for the state, no one can guarantee. The market guarantees you nothing. Many businesses, by the way, lose money for long, long periods of time. So he focuses the expectation part on the expected rate of return, which is the marginal efficiency of investment. And the key point is that this consumption propensity is taken to be more or less independent of the level of income. And therefore, savings, the savings rate, which is just 1 minus small c, at this level of abstraction, is taken to be dependent only on the behavior of consumers and independent of income, so it's given. Okay. And that tells you that you get an equilibrium output, level of output, which is essentially run by this investment variable. Because as Keynes points out, investments are volatile, uh, expectations are volatile. So you have all these mood swings in expectations, and these make investment move up and down, and output moves up and down. And the expectation can lead to a collapse in investment if your mood swing is sufficiently black, so to speak. And then you have output and employment falling. So this is Keynes's understanding, uh, formalization of his practical observation, which is that Europe is stuck in a depression in the 1920s. And then the Great Depression hits, and the whole world joins Europe in that depth of despair. OK? Now notice, from this point of view, savings adjust to investment. Because savings is, if I take the small s and I move it to the left-hand side, s times y is big S, which is savings. And savings is dependent on two autonomous components, one which is autonomous uh, in the short run, which is autonomous consumption, and the other investment, which based on expectations, which in this formulation, it doesn't depend anyway on capacity utilization or short run variables. So the right-hand side here is given, and on the left-hand side is savings. But if the savings rate is fixed, then the only thing that can make savings equal to investment is output. So how does aggregate demand equal aggregate supply? In the Keynes' answer, it is by supply adjusting to demand. These are the autonomous elements of demand, and the supply does the adjustment. Joan Robinson has famously said, I believe she even told me this story when I was a graduate student, that when they first encountered it, it was so difficult to understand and so difficult to persuade other people that th this could be true because they were so used to the other formulation. And she said she used to go out with Mead walking in the meadows and, and byways of Cambridge arguing, um, trying to persuade him that this was sensible and consistent because it appeared to be completely bizarre com if you knew the idea that uh, full employment would be automatic and demand would be equal to supply. And here is the idea that output is determined by these autonomous elements, which somehow will not make it full employment. Right? Everybody with me here? But now you notice something, uh, some of the elements that are characteristic of this relationship. Savings adjust to, to uh, investment, or rather, demand adjusts to, uh, I mean, supply adjusts to demand by the changes of output. Uh, it follows from this that the employment is run by aggregate demand. 
because the level of output determines the level of employment in any given structure of production. So that means if profit expectations were depressed, then the employment level would be low, consistent with many observed empirical phenomena. A fall in the savings rate, which is a rise in the consumption rate, in this argument would be good. Because a fall in the savings rate would increase uh, it would reduce this and therefore increase the multiplier effect, and so it would pump up the economy. This is known in uh, post Keynesian economics as the paradox of thrift. I'm going to argue it's wrong, but uh, we're now still talking about Keynes. It's wrong in, in, in the sense that it's only partial. So if this is true, then if you're a neoclassical, you're going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's something funny about this here. Maybe it's true in the short run. But isn't it true that if you have unemployment, then profitability? then wages will fall, real wages will fall, in which case the profit rate will rise, in which case the investment will rise and will bring you back to full employment. So there is a path back to the neoclassical story if you can link real wages, unemployment to real wages to profitability, which is their original path in the first place. Okay? Everybody with me here? Secondly, isn't it true that if you have unemployment, I output is too low, that if something automatically reduces the interest rate, then uh, you will increase investment, and therefore you'll increase aggregate demand, and you'll increase output, and you increase employment. So you need those two things. Keynes' argument is vulnerable to, because if either one of them can move automatically to bring you back to full employment, then this argument simply is another way to get there. Maybe you'd say it takes a little longer, but it's another way to get there. And this is one of the points of attack on Keynes right away. Uh, what determines the profit rate? But Keynes kind of cheats here. He knows perfectly well, from the, because this is good. He's the preeminent neoclassical before he becomes a Keynesian, right? He knows perfectly well that the profit rate is determined by the marginal product of capital. But instead he does is he shifts the focus and says, well, this is the expected profit rate, and the expectations are long run, and they're never going to move in such a way as to make it. In fact, he says just the opposite. He says, look, if you have unemployment, then capitalists are going to be depressed. The animal spirits are going to be subdued, and the interest, expected interest uh, rate of return will be low, and so things will become worse, not better, in a crisis. He also says, well, it's not true that unemployment reduces real wages. Now, again, he cheats. He says, well, OK, it does in the long run. But in the medium run, it won't for a variety of reasons. And he throws up a series. He does concede afterwards the general theory that persistent unemployment would erode the real wage. But you could view his argument as saying that it would take so long for the real wage to fall to the levels of being full employment that you would go through a, a long period of suffering. And he's observed already decades. So he's, when he means a long period, he means practically a, a social uh, disaster. But he tries to do it by giving specific reasons why unemployment will not make real wages automatically fall to the level where you get full employment. He says, for instance, um, a drop in demand that generated unemployment would lower prices. Because that's, now notice this is a little bit of a trick. He's not saying markup pricing. He's saying if you have a drop in demand, or he need not be saying markup pricing, if you have a drop in demand, firms have excess supply, and they may lower their prices to get rid of it. So if you have a drop in demand, even though you have unemployment, Real wages may actually um, rise rather than fall. They move in the opposite direction. Now, this actually is empirically true. We looked at some of the data in the first uh, part of this course, uh, first part of last semester, I think, where I talked about the Great Depression and the movements of the real wage. And you can see that, surprisingly, in the Great Depression, even though unemployment swells to 25%, one out of every four people is officially unemployed. The official rate is too low. It's probably like, uh, uh, at least uh, a third of people, or maybe even more, are unemployed. And yet the real wage is rising. And when you look at that, you go, wait a minute, how can that be? How can the real wage go up? And Keynes' answer is exactly right. What happens is that money wages are contractually uh, up, done. So you have your money wage for as long as you've got a job, right? So comes the Depression, people lose their jobs. The ones left are still their contracts working out. So their money wage changes, little or slowly. Meantime, the firms who have lost all their Demand are dumping goods at low prices, so price level has dropped. The money wage of still employed workers hasn't dropped very much, and the real wage shoots up. And you can look at this empirically. Just go back and look at data from the BLS and BEA over that period, and you'll see something quite surprising. A depression causes real wages to rise. And Keynes' argument is essentially that these are the process of adjustment moves you in the wrong direction in the short run. So then the free market would actually make things worse. Um, The other thing he says is, well, look, if you have a depression, then surely 
expectations of profitability are going to fall because actual realized profits have fallen. So this will make investment fall and make the depression worse, not better. So the immediate reaction is in the wrong direction in both cases. Real wages rise when they should be falling. Profit expectations fall when they should be rising. Now, anybody who's ever studied business cycle theory, including one of the founders of the New School, Wesley Clare Mitchell, would tell you that that's typical in the business cycle. The mechanisms go in the wrong direction at first, but after a while they catch up and come back and the cycle restore. Gaines's point is that we're looking at the depressions of the 1920s, the post-World War I depression, and then the Great Depression in the 1930s, you're talking about two or three generations of people who are under great misery and privation due to that, and you cannot simply say the market's going to bounce back. Here is the market, and it is not bouncing back. It's bouncing in the other direction. So from this, he concludes that um, in a crisis, it would be far better to have the state engage in fiscal policy. Remember, he'd already started making this argument before he wrote the general theory. He's now have a formal foundation for this argument, which is that if I add G plus T up here, then I can pump up the output, and I, don't, I can counter the wrong signals that the market is giving. And so that validates his argument that fiscal policy, deficit spending, deficit finance fiscal policy, can pump up the system. Uh, notice that uh, the theory of the interest rate in Keynes also has to be different because otherwise the interest rate could do the work. And again, by switching away from the loanable funds, if you talk to a Keynesian and you say loanable funds, it's like slapping them in the face. They're going to be absolutely frantic because loanable funds is that evil thing that used to justify neoclassical theory. Now I'm going to argue that, in fact, loanable funds is a perfectly sensible argument because in another context it doesn't have this implication at all. It has to do with the demand supply for credit. Uh, and um, in effect, I already talked about that last semester when I talked about the theory of the interest rate, which is that all these short-term factors don't matter because the equalization of profits creates an interest rate through demand and supply. But that loadable fund market doesn't produce full employment. It produces an interest rate which will give you a normal profit rate. And so in effect, the have a loadable funds type of argument does not imply the neoclassical theory at all because the classical story of the interest rate is that, that loadable funds, both demand and supply change. They're not just fixed in space. Okay. So he substitutes, as I said, the, the theory of uh, interest. He has to have a different theory of interest to prevent that loop in his loophole in his argument from being closed. And so he comes up with the idea of uh, the uh, demand supply for money, a liquidity preference. And one could view that as a way of blocking uh, the return of the neoclassic argument. You know how in vampire movies, vampires are always Christians. I never quite figured this out, but vampires are always Christians because you just have to go up there and you know, do this and they melt and stuff like that. So this is the contra-vampire argument, if you do the uh, money supply, uh, the liquidity preference argument, because that blocks away um, any idea that um, interest rates will automatically solve the problem. Now, this framework, all the elements are here. You have the demand and supply relationship. You can see this becomes IS. And then you have uh, the money demand and money supply and you get LM, and you get the familiar ISLM formulation of Hicks. In fact, Hicks is, it has been argued that Keynes actually uses something like ISLM in his lectures. People who took notes during his lectures would say that he actually had equations similar to this. And we know that um, uh, at a conference in 1937, one year after the general theory was published, Harrod and Hicks both presented papers summarizing Keynes's argument, the argument I just finished summarizing here. And uh, both of them summarized in a set of simultaneous equations. Keynes <coughs> gave his approval to Hicks, but he really liked Harrod's argument better because Harrod's equations, which is a good paper, by the way, to look up, Harrod's equations versus Hicks equations on Keynes's theory. <coughs> he liked Harrod's equations better. But what Hicks did, uh, Hick and Mead, the famous Mead arguing with Joan Robinson in the uh, meadows and byways around Cambridge, um, also presented a verbal representation of Hicks. Because here is general theory. It's just come out. These brilliant young people uh, are around. And they are summarizing and presenting it in conferences. That's how this goes. And uh, Hicks is there. Harrod is there. And Mead is there. Um, and Keynes says he, he likes Hicks. He says Hicks's paper is good, but he has a complaint about it. Because he says, well, I made the assumption that investment 
is um, a function of where did I put it? Oh, sorry, I went too far the other way. I made the assumption that investment is a function of expected profitability. And Hicks leaves that expected profitability out. He takes it as the constant. Now, if you do that, you notice that then investment is a downward sloping function of the interest rate. Because the higher the interest rate, which is a negative impact, the lower the investment. And one of Hicks, uh, uh, Keynes's complaints was that the expected profitability should be having a major role, because that's what moves all these cycles up and down. And you can't leave it out. You can think of it as fluctuating, and fluctuating in a particular way, in an upturn and a downturn. But if you remove it, you remove one of the key dynamics of the argument, especially about crises. So, um, but what Hicks did that beat all the others is he had a great diagram. Uh, the others, are mix, Mead had a verbal exposition. Harrod had an algebraic exposition, which Keynes thought was more true to his own argument. But what Hicks did is go back and modify his paper, and he added a diagram after he hearing what Mead and um, uh, um, Harrod had to say. And he had a paper in which this famous ISLM diagram, which then took over macroeconomics. It's still used today. So the IS relationship is essentially uh, the equilibrium, the level of output determined by investment equals savings. And the lower the interest rate, the higher the level of output will be because uh, investment will be higher. And so the, through the multiplier, output will be higher. Everybody from OK with that? The LM, again, familiar uh, liquidity preference argument of the interest rate, uh, of, of the supply and demand for money. And the money supply is taken as given. So you have here money supply, which is a function of uh, money supply here, which is a function of uh, determined by the state. I'm sorry, money demand, which is determined by income and in, uh, interest rate. And the money supply determined by the state. The money supply determined by the state is a fixed thing. So obviously, income and uh, interest rates must move against each other to make the uh, demand of money equal to the supply of money, the equilibrium condition, right? So a higher level of income raises the demand for money. And uh, this would have to be counterbalanced by a higher interest rate, which would lower the demand for money. Because if the interest rate is higher, people are less likely to hold the money as uh, non-earning uh, assets and they're more likely to lend it. So if the income goes up, the interest rate must go down. The curves must be sloped in the opposite direction. And so if the income goes up, uh, what did I say? The interest rate must go up. What did I just said backwards. Hang on a second. Yeah. If the income goes up, the interest rate must be higher to lower the demand for money. So they must move in the same direction. So you have the LM curve upward sloping and the IS curve downward sloping. And by the summary of those two equations now, with the interest rate it determined within the multiplier, by the expanded multiplier story, you have a particular equilibrium level of interest and a particular equilibrium level of output. Now, from this framework, you can see that the interest that becomes, uh, 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 let me not say that, not yet. Okay. You can see that adding aggregate demand through on the investment side, so now you have government deficit spending, is going to shift this IS curve. And that means you'll give you a higher level of output, other things being equal, also a higher level of the interest rate. So expansionary fiscal policy would shift the curve upward, which would raise, raise the level of equilibrium output and a higher interest rate. On the other hand, expanding the money supply would shift the LM curve outward. And this would decrease output and decrease the interest rate at any given IS curve. Right? So you move from here, you move this way. So uh, I'm sorry, increased output and decreased the interest rate at any given IS. And that, another way to put that is that the state can always make a combination of fiscal and monetary policies that will give you the desired level of output, full employment, by appropriately shifting these curves so that they intersect up here. And that shifts the burden, so to speak, from the market to the state to produce socially desired outcomes. And Keynes famously says, look, He's, he's not a modest man, no reason for him to be modest. I'm saving capitalism and I'm saving economic theory also because you always talk about full employment and politically we talk about the importance of it. But I, with my framework, can produce it and maintain it. And therefore, the neoclassical theory, Keynes says, comes into its own through state policy. So whereas the neoclassicals say that the invisible hand will bring you 
to the right point. Keynes is saying the visible hand of the state will bring you to that point. Now, as I said before, one of the arguments that Keynes makes himself and, and Keynesians have made is that these curves cannot be taken to be, if you're serious about Keynes's own formulation where the demand of money depends on expectations and interest rate expectations and output expectations and the uh, uh, profit expectations determine investment, then you cannot take these curves to be uh, indifferent, so to speak, to the state of the economy. What do I mean by that? For instance, a rise in business confidence, animal spirits. So the expected rate of profit goes up. That's going to raise uh, investment. It's going to cause the multiplier through the multiplier to raise output. It's going to shift this curve this way. So expectations, which is left out of Hicks's formulation, can move, uh, can cause higher output and higher interest rates. Conversely, a depression would have the opposite impact. The expected profit rate will fall, and the curve will shift. IS curve will shift in, and therefore you'll have a lower level of output and a uh, um, lower interest rate. Um, so you could understand this process as the boom and bust. Expectations rise of profitability. You get a boom. Output rises. Interest rates rise. And then as these expectations uh, peak and die out, then you come back down and you fall. So you move. These curves uh, produce a, a cyclical or at least a, a path of ups and downs. And that raises the question why, if expectations create output, why do they ever collapse? That's a non-trivial point, because if expectations cause the output to actually increase, then they have validated themselves. So why do they collapse? And this is a point I made earlier about Soros' theory of reflexivity. You have to have some theory of the fundamentals of these expectations. Otherwise, expectations are self-validating. The roadrunner runs right off here into the space and stays. And as long as he believes, there's no problem. Keynesian economics then becomes prominent in the 1930s uh, in the Great Depression because it was able to make sense of what people were seeing and propose a solution. And the solution was intervention by the state. One could read Hitler's rearmament in part as that. You can certainly see that in uh, Roosevelt's interventions, including employment, direct employment, and running of deficits. Across the capitalist world, you can see that this uh, is a thing that all the states are struggling with. And pretty much um, after World War, and World War II, by the way, you can clearly see this, huge rise in deficits across the world as they fight, as the capitalist countries fight each other. And all of that creates output and employment and destroys output and employment too subsequently. From this point of view, uh, it seemed pretty sensible that macroeconomic policy had now come into its own. It could produce desired levels of employment at an interest rate that was tolerable. Um, and so the period from 1950 to 1973 became viewed as a golden age of macro policy sustained by Keynesian policies. In those days, it was very hard to be a non-Keynesian. There were some, obviously. And they came back in power, actually. Friedman, for instance, and Hayek and others. But the Keynesians dominated. It was just taken for granted that you had the power now to create a capitalism that was socially uh, uh, viable because it could create an employment level that was desired. And yes, there may be some cost to it, but the state had ways to mitigate those costs, too. And now we come to the key point. If this is a full employment level, and the state moves L, M, and I, S around until you're at the full employment level, then the problem is that as you get closer to this level, as Joan Robinson long pointed out, long ago pointed out, as you get closer, individual uh, businesses, individual uh, sectors will be already reaching their supply limits, their full employment limits. In other words, full employment is not an abstract number. Full employment, there may be uh, unemployment here, and there may be uh, uh, insufficiency of workers over there. So just because it's average close to uh, full employment rate, which is never zero, because there are always people moving from one job to another, frictional unemployment. But if it gets to within 2%, that means that some businesses are shortage of workers, and others still have some workers uh, as, uh, uh, they could hire if they could expand. So these, from that point of view, will have reached their supply limits. That means as you get closer to full employment, more businesses and more sectors will be hitting the limit of availability of labor. And the only thing they can do when demand rises in such a situation is to raise prices. So we'd expect, in the most abstract level, we'd expect prices to rise only when you, go, you raise the, let's say, the IS curve goes beyond the full employment level. You pump up the system beyond 
this YFE, which is the full employment level. If you raise the IS curve up here, then you're going to get inflation. But in practice, as you get closer to here, inflation will start. And so Keynesians already had an expectation of a relationship between uh, the approach of full employment and the approach of inflation. The more you reduce employment, uh, unemployment, the more you pump up the system, the more inflation you're going to get. How much? They didn't have any formal network, uh, uh, framework. And this is where Phillips comes in. Phillips did not invent his argument to solve the problem of Keynesian planners, of Keynesian macroeconomists. But his paper became the foundation, a foundational tool of Keynesian macroeconomics because his paper showed empirically that there was a negative relationship between the rate of growth of money wages, rate of growth of money wages, and unemployment. The tighter, the, the r smaller the unemployment rate, the higher the rate of growth of money wages. Uh, it, that Phillips paper, which is in, cited in the book, is really worth reading because it's a brilliant paper. It's not what you think. It's not what's presented in textbook. He goes over a long period of time, and he takes out the cyclical components because he's interested in the structural ones. And he looks at the rate of change of money wages, not prices. And he shows that when you adjust for these cyclical things, you have a downward sloping curve or an inverse relationship. The lower the unemployment level, the higher the rate of money wages. And there is an unemployment level at which the rate of money wages is zero. Uh, so the curve cuts the axis. We're going to come to it in a minute. But that isn't what the Keynesians need. The Keynesians need a relationship between prices and unemployment. Everybody understand why, right? Because it follows from the logic of the theory. They can pump up the system to full employment, but they get inflation around here. They need a more formal way to know how much inflation, how much of a trade-off. And they, began by, they begin by saying, well, look, let's assume that prices are proportional to wages. This brings in the markup idea. If there's a stable relationship between prices and wages, then the rate of change of prices, which is inflation, is going to be negatively related to the rate of change of unemployment on the basis of the Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve is transformed into an inflation unemployment curve. <coughs> and it's even called a Phillips curve, but it isn't a Phillips curve. It's an unemployment inflation curve based on the assumption that inflation is proportional to the rise of wages. <coughs> Excuse me, everybody with me here? So let's look at the Phillips curve. You can understand that this is a great tool because these practical people working in treasuries across the capitalist countries, <coughs> globe, are struggling to figure out the relationship. So here is the actual. Phillips curve, <coughs> in the United States from 1955 to 1970. This is the golden age of Keynesian economics. Here you have the inflation rate, and here you have the unemployment rate. And you can duplicate this data, by the way. All the citation, the sources are in the book. You can easily go on the BA, uh, get the price level and the unemployment rate. And you'll find that this has a remarkable inverse relationship. Notice Phillips is concerned with the cyclically adjusted, not the actual. But I could see that the cycles are causing these fluctuations. And if I did a HP filter, which is a, one of the ways you take out cycles to get a trend, then you should expect to see this negative relationship. Notice something here. This point here is with zero inflation because it's a point where the inflation line crosses 0, and it's an unemployment rate of 7%. That the data is telling you in the US economy in that time period, if you want zero inflation, you have to have 7% unemployment. Now, this is a time when Soviet Union is lurking, communism is rising, and one of the things that communists are saying, socialists are saying, is look, capitalism produces the reserve army of labor, unemployment. And so if we are in this region, a lot of people are unemployed. 7% unemployment probably means closer to 12 15% true unemployment, because there are people who have part-time work, people who wish to work and are not counted, and so on. We know that now because we have numbers to estimate that part. So that's a lot. So a, a Keynesian planner could say, but look, suppose we wanted unemployment to be 4%, which includes people going from work and you know, looking for work, moving from one job and all that. Then couldn't we tolerate 3% inflation? That's not a lot. So Keynesian policy Im already implicitly had this inflation bias. Because by tolerating more inflation, you could reduce unemployment. And you can see that in the literature, the discussion at the time. What's wrong with 3% inflation if it means that we can cut the unemployment rate from 7% to 4% or even lower? So the practical debate becomes about how much inflation is tolerable. And inflation becomes viewed as good because it's associated with lower unemployment. 
And that notion that inflation is good sort of remains even in neoclassical theory, even in policy. When Janet Yellen talks about how to uh, reflate the economy, or you talk about Japanese deflation, you're talking about moving it towards uh, the desired level of inflation. Now, I made the point in the first lecture of the first last semester, of course, that inflation is an entirely new phenomenon. If you look from 1780 in the United States or England, and this is the price level, you will see that it goes in waves like this. And you come to 1939, and you're the same level as you were in 1780. So that for that whole time period, there has been no secular change in the price level. There have been cyclical ones. But then after 1939, the price level never stops coming down, ever. There have been brief hiccups in a depression or something, uh, but it just keeps on rising. And if you put it, if I would put them on the same scale, then these big fluctuations that appeared when there was no trend become tiny compared to the trend itself. So inflation in the modern phenomena, it comes actually in the post-war period. It comes from World War II, and one could argue it comes from modern Keynesian and other macroeconomic policies. The problem for the Keynesians was the Phillips curve fell apart. It, just about the time when everybody took it for granted, it fell apart. And what happened instead is that inflation began to rise, but so did unemployment, which is from a Phillips curve. Notice a Phillips curve is a negative relationship. If inflation rises, unemployment should fall. That's the whole point. So if we stimulate the economy and make it more inflationary, we should get lower unemployment. But look what's happening. This is the period from uh, 1955 to 1970. The unemployment rate is less than 5%, and inflation is about 2.5%. Now, if the unemployment rate goes up, we would expect inflation to go down from the Phillips curve relationship. But instead, inflation goes up. It goes up hugely. So it completely contradicts the Phillips curve. And in fact, that led to an intractable difficulty for Keynesian economics. How can you explain something that your theory says shouldn't happen? And so people began to introduce expectations and shifting Phillips curves. And everybody was dreaming of a Nobel Prize for solving that problem. And somebody did get a Nobel Prize for solving that problem, but it wasn't a Keynesian. It was Friedman and Phelps. But let me just show you what happens if you were plotting Phillips curves. The first, uh, let me go back a little bit. The, the first Phillips curve is 1955, 1970, absolutely lovely. Then you go to 1970 to 1980, and whoa, where's that downward sloping relation? It's gone. And then you go over the whole post-war period, 1955 to 2010, and you really have a hard time finding any downward sloping. In fact, you don't have a downward sloping. Anybody looking at this in first year undergraduate econometrics would say this is not a downward sloping demand curve. It's a, a line, and you're going to have some problem making up dummy variables that will extract from this a series of shifting curves. Now, you know, if you have a curve, you can always shift it up and down, and you can fit almost every point, but then you have to have a rationale for that variable that you can test. You can't just move it up and down. So that was the problem facing Keynesian economists. How to explain this, the Phillips curve. OK, good. So we know the answer. Keynesian economists were not able to explain it, uh, not within the framework that they had, not within the framework that they tried to invent, including shifting curves due to expectations. And the failure of Keynesian economics as a practical tool of maintaining low unemployment and acceptable inflation. Uh, because both went up, by the way. Unemployment went up and inflation went up. So they failed on both sides. Led to a counter argument. And that argument was advanced by Friedman and Phelps, but most famously by Friedman. And so we're going to start there next time. I'm going to try to race through from Friedman to Lucas to post-Keynesian economics and so on. Um, I'm going much slower than I expected, but I hope that I'll be able to get through this chapter. Um, but it's very important because the, in laying out the structure of the arguments, you begin to see that there's a series of problems that has to be resolved. Any theory will have to explain this problem. And I want to show you that there is a framework which can explain all of these problems, not as exceptions, but as natural consequences. But it is not Friedman's framework. It is not Keynes's framework. It's a classical one. So next time, we're going to talk about Friedman and the subsequent arguments, uh, Friedman, Phelps, and the return of neo Walrasian economics, so to speak. Um, and maybe if I get as far as
Lucas and uh, Nehru and all of those would be lovely. But if not, I'll finish up in a lecture after that. And then we're going to start a different task, which is to construct a consistent foundation for macroeconomics based on the same principles that profit regulates both demand and supply. And I'll try and show you that all of these patterns can then be explained as a natural consequence of that. Okay? <laughs>